In this video, I'll reveal 5 reasons why you can't lose weight if you have low growth hormone, along with 7 steps you can take to raise your growth hormone levels so that you can sleep better, look younger, and stay thinner. In the diet and weight loss universe, growth hormone is not something that's going to be a popular topic to talk about. I think the problem is because of the name it was given, growth hormone, which is only one of dozens of important health benefits that this hormone has, just like all the other hormones in your body. You may be surprised to hear that a good amount of growth hormone is needed to maintain a healthy weight, despite what the name suggests. In this video, I'll reveal 5 things you're likely doing that's lowering your growth hormone levels, and 7 things you can do to raise it so that you can more easily lose weight, look younger and healthier, and sleep better as well. Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Park, ENT surgeon and sleep physician. My passion is to help you get the sleep you need so that you can live the life you want. First, you need to know what growth hormone is and what it does since there's a lot of misinformation out there, especially when it's promoted as an anti-aging or muscle building hormone. I'm not going to talk about supplementing with growth hormone since that has to be done under your doctor's care. What I am going to talk about is how you can avoid 5 common habits and toxins so that your body can make more growth hormone naturally. It's also much safer. Growth hormone is made in the anterior pituitary gland at the base of your brain, behind the back of your nose, along with many other hormones. Its main target is not your bones, but the liver, where it stimulates what's called insulin-like growth hormone 1, or IGH-1. IGH-1 then goes out to the rest of the body to grow muscles and bone. Insulin and growth hormone both promote muscle protein growth, which is called an anabolic state. With blood glucose levels, insulin allows cells to take in glucose, so it lowers glucose levels, whereas growth hormone promotes new glucose production in the liver to raise glucose levels. This happens when growth hormone activates an enzyme called lipase that breaks down your body fat into glycerol and fatty acids. The glycerol goes back to the liver and is made into glucose. So this makes growth hormone a fat dissolving hormone, whereas insulin promotes fat buildup. Growth hormone also keeps your body's collagen healthy. So the lower your level of growth hormone, the older you'll look and feel. So the bottom line is that if you don't have enough growth hormone, you'll age faster and you can't break down fat so you can't lose weight. Here's also an interesting fact about growth hormone. Men and women produce growth hormone differently. In men, it's secreted mostly during sleep or slow wave sleep, which happens mainly in the first half of the night. You can have some activity during the day as well, but it's mostly in the first half of the night. But in women, you have many spikes throughout the day, and it's also related to the levels of estrogen present. For example, women's growth hormone levels go up with the onset of ovulation when estrogen goes up. And this goes along with the finding that growth hormone in women doesn't drop as much at the same rate as for men as they age until menopause when estrogen is much lower. So to summarize, you need a good amount of growth hormone to build good muscle mass, strong bones, and to break down body fat. Now here are 5 common things that will lower your growth hormone levels. I guarantee that all of you watching this video will be exposed to many if not all the following 5 situations. As I go through these 5 items, let me know in the comments area which ones that you are affected by. It's a way of writing this down so that you can make a commitment and take the steps needed to become healthier. Number 1 is that you're eating way too much carbohydrates or sugar. Carbs get converted to glucose in your bloodstream which spikes your insulin levels leading to more fat buildup. And we know that insulin lowers growth hormone. This concept completely validates my number one rule for overall better sleep and health. Avoid eating or snacking within 3-4 to four hours of bedtime. Especially for men, the more insulin you have on board during the first part of your sleep time, which is mostly deep sleep, the less growth hormone you'll create. It's not as bad for women since growth hormone spikes throughout the day, but there are many other good reasons to avoid eating close to bedtime, which I'll cover in reason number 3 below. Number 2 is that growth hormone is much lower if you don't sleep well. Here's a study showing that in 15 subjects with insomnia, growth hormone was detectable on blood tests in only 3 people. There was a direct correlation between total wake time at night and cortisol as well as norepinephrine, both known stress hormones. Total wake time was also inversely related to growth hormone levels. Just think about what that means, especially for the large proportion of people in the US that can't sleep for various reasons. Number 3. We also know that people with obstructive sleep apnea have lower growth hormone levels. We can also lump in upper airway resistance syndrome or UARS patients who are people who can't sleep due to breathing problems at night but who don't quite meet the former criteria for sleep apnea. 
and repeated episodes of low oxygen during sleep apnea can cause liver damage, which prevents growth hormone conversion to insulin-like growth hormone 1. Number 4. Any type of stress can lower growth hormone. I mentioned that stress hormones were higher in patients with insomnia along with lower growth hormone levels. One of the eureka moments that prompted me to write my book Sleep Interrupted many years ago was when I read Why Zeros Don't Get Ulcers by Dr. Robert Sapolsky. He writes that suddenly being chased by a lion is a stressful event and can potentially save your life. And he goes into great detail about what happens inside our bodies when we're under stress. After you escape, you then relax. I strongly recommend you read his book, especially his funny version of how the term fight or flight response was coined by Dr. Hans Seye. He argues that modern life never turns off this low-grade chronic stress response and that this is what causes most modern diseases. If you accept my argument that modern faces are shrinking, this also means that we can't breathe properly at night. And this leads to frequent micro-obstructions and arousals with fragmented sleep. And this will lead to a chronic state of physiologic stress. However, your body doesn't care what's causing the stress, whether it's a physical danger or emotional or psychological stresses. Your body reacts the same way. Think about the last time you had a nightmare. Your body reacted in the same way as if it were real. And lastly, the fifth category are the multiple endocrine disruptors in our environment. You have countless pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, plastics, fluoride in our water supply, and endocrine disruptors in our food, clothing, personal care products, and furniture. You can clearly see what's happening to our children as girls are entering puberty many years earlier, along with the obesity epidemic, where about 40% of the US population is obese and 74% are obese or overweight. One of the most common herbicides that's sprayed multiple times on our food supply is glyphosate, which is the main ingredient in the weed color Roundup. One of its many documented dangers is liver damage by blocking the cytochrome P450 enzymes which helps to detoxify environmental toxins, also activates vitamin D3, processes vitamin A, and makes bile and sulfates for the gut. One of many interesting practical applications of all these concepts and how everything is so intricately connected with the human body is the example of lower progesterone levels in women due to too much estrogen in our environment. As I mentioned in past videos, lowered progesterone in perimenopausal women can lead to sleep problems since progesterone strengthens tongue muscle tone while breathing at night. If you have lowered growth hormone for the various reasons I mentioned so far, then you have less insulin-like growth factor 1 that the liver makes. We know that IGF-1 helps the cytochrome P450 enzymes to process cholesterol into progesterone. Poor sleep also leads to more weight gain, and this worsens possible sleep apnea with lowered oxygen levels, and the vicious cycle continues with less growth hormone. We also know that glyphosate blocks the cytochrome P450 enzymes in the liver. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. All this contributes to either weight gain, heart disease, or cancer, or all of the above. So how can you raise your growth hormone levels? The simple answer is to avoid the five things I talked about above. But let me go a bit more in detail and expand this to seven total ways. Number one, don't eat anything close to bedtime, depending on what you just ate and how much you just ate. Some studies show that it may take up to four to five hours. My recommendation is 3-4 to four hours before you go to bed. And don't stay up longer if you eat late for the reasons stated in this video. This is why intermittent fasting works so well. I won't get into too much detail about intermittent fasting, but only to say that there are many different variations and protocols. The basic principle is that you limit the window that you eat all your meals within a limited time span during the day. The least restrictive being a 12-hour window and all the way down to an 8-hour window. There are also variations like alternate day fasting or one meal a day, but the focus is the timing rather than eating less. One important thing to note is that my rule for eating before bedtime still applies. Make sure to finish your last meal at least 3-4 to four hours before your normal bedtime. Number two is to cut down drastically your carbohydrate and sugar intake. Eat more healthy saturated fats found in red meat from grass-fed and finished cows, wild caught seafood, and healthier varieties of oil such as olive oil, coconut oil, and avocado oil. Stay away from seed oils, which are highly processed and have too much of the omega-6 fatty acids. These oils are much more likely to cause oxidative stress in your mitochondria. And don't worry about your cholesterol levels too much. I'll put links to the videos below on cholesterol and the statin wars by Dr. Marianne Damasi, Dr. Chris Noby on the dangers of seed oils, and Sugar, the Bitter Truth by Dr. Robert Lustig. Number three is to lose weight. As I mentioned, there's an inverse correlation between visceral fat and growth hormone. 
the more the insulin resistance, the lower the level of growth hormone. I know this is easier said than done, but if you follow the advice in this video, you have a much higher chance of not only losing weight on a permanent basis, but also become healthier and less need to take prescription medications. Number four, you must prioritize sleep. If you're not sleeping long enough, start by going to bed earlier. Avoid any screens within two hours of bedtime as blue light from these screens block melatonin, your sleep hormone. For most cases of insomnia, follow routine sleep hygiene tips that you can find on the internet. If you're still struggling, see a sleep doctor for professional help. As you get older, the more likely you have obstructive sleep apnea even if you're thin or don't snore. Especially if you wake up to go to the bathroom at night due to a hormone made by the heart called atrial natriuretic peptide that makes you pee more. This is one area that most weight experts don't stress. Sleep apnea and upper airway resistance syndrome is a major form of physiologic stress. Number five, do an inventory of potential exposure to endocrine disruptors. This may seem like a daunting task, but start by making a list of the most likely offenders and take action one at a time. The Environmental Working Group is a good resource for this. There are also lots of good websites to help you get started, and I'll put some of the resources down below. I also place links to my podcast on this important topic. Again, cut out all screens, including your smartphone, before bedtime. This is a major endocrine disruptor as well. Number six, lower stress. I recommend you read Dr. Sapolsky's book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, the acclaimed guide to stress, stress-related diseases, and coping. Number seven, intense exercise has been found to increase growth hormone as lifting weights or sprinting. Building or maintaining muscle mass is important for metabolic health, but not too much since the excessive exercise can raise your stress levels and increase your risk of dying early, especially with running. I mentioned in my video 11 surprising reasons why you can't lose weight that strenuous joggers had an adjusted death rate of almost two times non-joggers, whereas light joggers died at a rate of one-fifth of the rate of non-joggers. And here's a bonus tip. You need adequate levels of growth hormone to have good levels of vitamin D, another important hormone. And vice versa, vitamin D stimulates levels of insulin-like growth hormone 1. Again, if you haven't done so already, please place in the comments area which one of the five things I mentioned you're doing to lower growth hormone and what you're going to do to address it. If you're still struggling to lose weight and nothing you've tried has worked for you, then check out this video here, 11 surprising reasons why you can't lose weight. And if you keep waking up to pee once, twice, or even three or more times at night, make sure to watch this video before you see a urologist.